Many people chase success and they neglect happiness. I've ticked all the boxes of societal success, but until a few years ago, I honestly don't think I was happy. But who you are is not how you have to stay. The uncomfortable truth is... Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Rongan Chatterjee. Like I've said that 80 to 90% of what we see as doctors is in some way related to our collective modern lifestyles, right? And that's not putting blame on people. I understand modern life is tough and it's really hard for people to make the decisions that they actually want to make for their health. But for a few years, there's been an idea that's been niggling away at me. Why do some people make changes for a few weeks, for a few months, and then they flip back to where they were before? I thought, well, what is it? Is it just information? If you give people the inspiration, the information, they feel better when they make those changes, yet they still can't keep them going. What's going on? And so I was on a quest to find out, well, is there something that's even more upstream than lifestyle? And I think there is. I look back over my 20-year career at the patients who have truly transformed their lives, not just for a few weeks or a few months, but really turned a corner. I think, well, what's going on with them? I think about the research and what it shows. And it's very, very clear that there is a further cause upstream from our lifestyle and that's our happiness and our mental well-being. Right, now I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. And so at the start of the book, I, I've got this up in the introduction. And a lot of you I know will be bought into the idea that your lifestyle influences your health, right? And hopefully a lot of you have tried to make changes in the past and are continuing to do so. But how you feel about yourself and the world how you deal with conflict, how you approach your day-to-day -day life, your thoughts, your well-being, your mental well-being massively influences your day-to-day -day behaviors, your diet, your sleep, your movements, how you manage stress. And that then influences your physical health. Now, it is true that your approach to food, movement, sleep, and rest can also go up there and affect your thoughts and your well-being, for sure. But the point I'm going to try and make today is that if you focus on what's going on up there, your happiness, you will automatically start to feel healthier. No one's talking about happiness in, in this context. And I think this is the missing link in health. And I think this is the reason why so many people are not getting better and transforming their lives. Right? So why is happiness and health linked? Well, there's kind of two broad reasons for this. Number one, and I think this is the more obvious reason to get, people who feel happier and more content with their lives naturally make better lifestyle choices. Right? So if you feel pretty good with your life, and you're not getting overly stressed, I guess you like what you do for your job, you know, whatever, whatever happiness means to you, we'll get to my definition of happiness shortly you're less likely to dive into a tub of Ben and Jerry's in the evening. You know? You're less likely to be waiting for 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. to have a few glasses of wine to unwind. But I'm not having a go at any of these behaviors. I'm just trying to understand them and say happier people naturally make better lifestyle choices. I think that's something we can all get our heads around. But it's not just that. If you really go into the research, independent of your lifestyle, happier people are healthier. Right? And there's all kinds of studies out there to support this. The two that I chose to try and make this case in the book was one study where they looked at nuns over the course of their life. What was really interesting about this study is that all the nuns had the same lifestyle, same diet, same movements, same sleep and stress. So there was no difference in lifestyle but they found very, very clearly that the happier nuns were healthier and they lived significantly longer, even when lifestyles accounted for. So I think that's really, really interesting. And then a more recent study took two groups of people and exposed them all to what's called rhinovirus. It was in injected up their nose. So what's rhinovirus? It's the virus that causes the common cold. Now, and they, did, they tried to have a look at which group of people would get sick. 
and they could basically tell who was going to get sick by their mental well-being and their happiness. Basically, the how can I put this politely? The not so positive mood category. Does that make sense? Everyone following me? The not so positive mood category got sick three times more often right, than the other group who felt content and happy in their lives. Now, I think that's really, really profound, right? Everyone gets injected with the same bug. But your emotions, your mental well-being, your happiness determined hugely who gets sick. Well, so happiness and health is absolutely linked. So I think we need to be talking about it. I guess that begs the question, you know, what is happiness? And I'm going to get to my definition of happiness, which I hope you find useful in just a moment. Before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about my dad. So this is a picture of me and dad quite a few years ago now. Um, I don't know, I was probably seven or eight, something like that, I think. And I think my dad made a mistake that many people are still making today, which is conflating success and happiness. This is one of the biggest things, I think, out there, which is causing people problems with their mental well-being, but also their health, frankly, is that we think those two things are the same. Now, they can overlap for sure, but for most people... Unless you give it some thought, they are two completely separate things. Right, so let me tell you a little bit about Dad. Dad came to the UK in 1962. Right, so back then, the UK had a shortage of doctors, and the British government would recruit doctors from countries like India to fill the gaps here. So Dad comes over with, you know, like many immigrants, without much, to make a better life. Now... There's lots I could tell you about my dad's life, but the point I want to make here is that dad progressed in his career. He made consultants. He gave me and my brother a fantastic education. On paper, we had a good life. I never saw my dad growing up, pretty much. But, you know, on paper, things look good. And dad killed himself working like literally killed himself working, like I see so many people still doing today, right? So I'll give you a typical week for my dad, or a typical day. He was a consultant at Manchester Ward Infirmary, not far from here. He'd come home from work, 5.30, 6 o'clock-ish, and I, I can still remember, he'd go into the kitchen, mum would have dinner ready for him, he'd have his dinner, he'd go upstairs, he'd shave, come downstairs, and a car would pick him up at 7 p.m., Right? He'd go out all night doing GP house calls. He'd come back at 7 a.m. Again, breakfast, shave upstairs, and then drive 30 to 40 minutes into Manchester. Right? This went on for 30 years. So my dad only slept three nights a week for 30 years. And I am 100% sure the chronic sleep deprivation, the chronic stress is why at 58... He gets struck down with lupus, kidney failure, and spends the next 15 years until he dies chained to a kidney dialysis machine. Right? He got success, but he wasn't happy. And in my experience, many of us are kind of doing the same thing. Maybe not to that extreme, but on a similar level. We're chasing success and in the process, neglecting the things that truly make us happy. And that's why we get stressed out. We're not sleeping. We get burnt out. Well, I had a patient a few years ago, I don't know, six or seven years ago now, a chap called Stuart in his late 30s. Well, again, he fell into this trap. From the outside, it looked as though this guy was crushing life. Ran his own business, drove a sports car. You know, he works on his own terms at weekends, whenever he wants it. No one's going to tell him when he has to work or not. And he came in to see me at the surgery I was working in at the time, saying, Dr. Chastity, look, I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling. I sometimes wake up feeling really low. I can't motivate myself to get out of bed. Sometimes I feel quite indifferent about things in my life. Is this depression? And I spent a bit of time trying to understand what was going on. We did some tests. I would see him. And I, 
you know, I just thought, you know, I, I remember this. I asked him a question. I said, hey, you know, how often do you sort of see your friends? And he said, yeah, I'm busy. I, I don't really get time. I kind, of, I kind of see what they're up to on Instagram or Facebook. It was, it was, it's the bizarre thing of the 21st century where you can actually see what your, um, what your friends are eating for dinner or where they've been on holiday, but you don't actually have to see them. So I said, listen, what I want you to do for the next six weeks is I want you to see at least one of your friends a week in person. And when you're with them, I want you to put your phone away so you're really present for that interaction. Now, look, I I fully appreciate that wasn't the prescription he was expecting from me on that day. But, you know, the guy was desperate. And he really, really wanted to make a change. Anyway, he goes away. Six weeks later, he comes in to see me. And you could tell from his body language that things were different. He almost bounced into my room. And before, almost before I'd asked him, he said, yeah, life's great. I've got my mojo back. Things are really, really good. And I said, well, what's happened? He said, well, I started off every Sunday. I'd go to the local cafe, meet up with one of my friends in person. And then after two or three weeks we decided to set up a a -a five-a-side every Wednesday night after work. That was it, right? Six weeks later, he's like a different person. I saw him for a few months after that. Nothing reverted back. That one change made everything in his life start to fit and work better. Now, incidentally, you may have heard me talk about something called the ripple effect before. So it wasn't just that. That led to this ripple effect where actually... He realized he was so unfit playing five sides that he decided to start looking after himself a little bit better, going to sleep a bit early, not binging on box sets till so late. So that guy did not have an antidepressant deficiency, but he had a deficiency of friendship. And when he addressed that, everything in his life came back online. Now, I'm not saying that happens in every situation, but for this person... And I've seen this over and over again. This is a particular problem you see in men. I'm not saying you never see it in women, but it's typical. You see this a lot in young men. And we know that, you know, there's a real mental health problem in men between the age of 35 and 50, very high suicide rates. And not making time for those deep, meaningful connections is a big part of that. Right, so there's a chapter in the book called Have Massless Conversations. And essentially... What I make the case in that chapter is that these, what is a master's conversation? It's a conversation where you can take all these figurative masks off and truly be yourself and kind of be honest you know, reveal your insecurities and the things you're struggling with without fear of judgment or criticism. Now, many of us are lucky to have those people in our lives. Not everyone, but many of us but we're so busy chasing success or things that we actually don't have time to nourish those relationships. I've been guilty of this before, for sure. And it's really not that difficult. And it comes back to this whole idea of happiness via success. Many people chase success and they neglect happiness whilst they're doing it. And they find that they get that success and there's still that hole inside. I mean, I could give you countless examples, but... I mean, this comes to mind because I had a conversation with this chap a few weeks ago on my podcast, Johnny Wilkinson. I'm sure pretty much everyone in in, in this room knows who Johnny Wilkinson is. If you do not, he's one of England's and probably the world's most famous rugby players. In 2003, in the final minute of the World Cup final, he kicks the winning goal that gives England the World Cup. And what's incredible about this story for me is, and there's a section in the book, which is pretty provocative, I think, where I say your dreams won't make you happy. And Johnny wrote down when he was a little boy, I want to play for England, I want to win the World Cup. Problem is, at 24, he's achieved both of those dreams. And the problem is, is that he says, that, that he, he still says this, as the ball left his foot, he was starting to go down. And the next morning, he woke up, couldn't get out of bed. He felt empty, depressed. He felt nothing. He's had years of struggle on the back of this. On the outside, like with my dad, like with Stuart, things look great. He plays for England. He's won the World Cup. He's a hero. But inside, he's in inner turmoil. Many of us are doing the same thing. 
We're confusing the two things. And then there's a few exercises in the book to help you start to be a bit more intentional about this. One that I, I don't know if you've heard me talk about this in the media or not, or, but, but I think it's really powerful. Imagine you are on your deathbed right now, right? And look back on your life. What are, what are three things you will want to have done? Just have a think about it. What are three things? And then ask yourself, what are three happiness habits you would have to do on a weekly basis to ensure that you get that happy ending that you've just defined that you want? It's a very, very powerful exercise because what it does, it makes you realize that, oh, at the end of my life, for example, I want to have spent a lot of time with my friends and family. If that's, if that's something you're going to say, and if you look at your week to week life and go, man, I say I want that at the end of my life, but I'm too busy like Stuart to actually make that happen. You're going to really struggle. And, it, and here's the truth, right? The uncomfortable truth is, yes, we're all different. And we've all got different preferences and, and things that we want to do in life. But we pretty much know what every single one of us is going to say at the end of our life. How do we know that? Because palliative care nurses tell us over and over again, people say the same thing. I wish I'd worked less. I wish I'd spent more time with my friends and family. Right? I wish I'd allowed myself to be happy. And the big one for me that gets me every time that I think about it, I wish I'd lived the life that I wanted to live not the life that other people expected of me. How many of you are living the life that you want to live? Well, I know it's a deep question and it's not something you can answer necessarily overnight and change things the following morning, but just asking yourself these questions, developing the awareness that actually, you know what? Something is a bit off track here. That's the first step in change. For me, that first step happened when my dad died. Huge hole in my life, like for many people, when one of your parents dies. It wasn't just a, you know, um, an emotional hole. It was a physical hole. I used to care for my dad. So I'd see my dad three times a day, pretty much seven days a week. So I suddenly had all this time. So that forced me to ask a lot of these questions. And I've realized for much of my life, I was living someone else's life and I wasn't truly happy. So success v happiness is very, very important. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here.